As a boy, I used to come with my parents to Glasgow Cathedral every Easter. I knew all about the crucifixion thanks to my illustrated children's Bible. And in its pages, the story of Good Friday was set in a place that looked very Hollywood with a blonde, blue-eyed leading man. My understanding of the Easter story began with these images. I was the son of a painter, and now I'm one too. Growing up, I learned all about Christ's sacrifice through the work of great artists. I noticed that most of them had one thing in common. They hadn't left home. It was clear that hundreds of years ago, artists had to guess what the Holy Land looked like, and what they painted looked suspiciously European. In this Holy Week, I'm making my own very personal pilgrimage. I don't run out of paper. I've come to draw and paint the faces and places where the Easter story actually happened. This is epic stuff, isn't it? Seeing is believing. As an artist, it's my job to look at the world and to see things a little differently. All of it happened amidst this kind of noise and interruptions and unexpected chaos. I've brought along some of the masterpieces that gave me my first ideas about Christ's last days. Now I want to discover if seeing the Holy Land with my own eyes changes my understanding of the Bible story. Standing here on holy ground, will I be moved by the same places that inspired those amazing artists who came before me to illustrate the greatest story ever told? My interest in visiting the Holy Land really began in France. As a boy, I spent many summers here on the coast of Brittany, where my mother was born. But it wasn't all just buckets and spades and lazy days by the beach. I was always off visiting churches with my dad. He loved the atmosphere of these sacred buildings. This chapel, he saw something that helped inspire him to become a painter of religious subjects. It was for him a kind of vision. And there it is. It kick-started a whole series of Easter paintings. And here are some sketches that my father made of this very sculpture, standing on this spot 30 years ago. And I suspect that as a boy, I was probably nearby looking over his shoulder as he traced these marks. My dad repeatedly depicted the scene, the crucifixion in his work again and again. And in doing so, he joined the ranks of so many artists in history who have been obsessed with this subject. Dad painted all these without ever seeing this. I've come here to paint and draw in the actual places where the Easter story happened. At home, the colours can be grey and drab. Here in the Middle East, it's a whole new palette of golden sunshine. As an artist, I don't only paint what I see, but what I feel. And this place is intense. This puts the whole stories of the Bible onto a whole other level. This is the original wilderness. Isn't it beautiful? <laughs> really, really beautiful. Transports you. And I guess that's what faith is all about. We call this the Holy Land because it's given us three religions, which all worship one God, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Muslims and Christians acknowledge the existence of a prophet called Jesus. The life of that man would eventually inspire great faith and great art. For Christians, Jesus wasn't just a historical figure made out of literal facts. He was the son of God and a worker of miracles. 
The most famous miracle in the Easter story is Jesus' return from the dead. But there's another miracle that set the scene for the events of Holy Week. It's called the Transfiguration, and some say it happened on this mountain in Galilee, northern Israel. It's after this moment that the disciples realise their leader is the Son of God. Jesus was now a celebrity, a thorn in the side of the religious authorities. The countdown had begun to his death on the cross a few weeks later on Good Friday. Jesus and three of his disciples came up here on what was shaping up to be just another day. But as they reached the summit, according to my children's illustrated Bible, something strange happened. Jesus' face began to shine like the sun and his clothes were white as light. Suddenly, beside him there appeared the Old Testament prophets Moses and Elijah. And as the apostles fell to the ground, they heard the voice of God declaring, This is my beloved son. As a boy, I loved this magical picture, but it was a real masterpiece that shaped my understanding of what miracles look like. On this trip, I've brought along some of my favourite religious paintings, and this image is by Raphael. It depicts the transfiguration, and he seems to have really breathed life into this whole religious story. This painting isn't really about pedantic details and accuracy, it's about the CGI, the special effects, and Raphael is really up the ante because he's depicted Jesus levitating up into the sky, something that actually isn't described in the Gospels, but Raphael knew it was an opportunity for him to use a little bit of artistic interpretation to create the most awe-inspiring scene he could dream up. But being here beneath these skies, I think Galilee does look like a setting for miracles. Standing up here on a day like this, you do get the sense that this is the kind of place where God might just flex his muscles. Raphael dreamt up this painting in Italy. But I've come here to see the real faces and places of the Easter story with my own eyes. I'll be using my children's Bible as a guide. The New Testament contains four accounts, the Gospels, they tell of Jesus' last days, what's called Holy Week. Now, I've never been entirely clear about this, but by tradition, they were written by four early Christians, 30 to 70 years after the life of Jesus. And although they do differ in certain details, when they're read together, they help give you an almost blow-by-blow -blow account of Jesus' last days. It's a bit of a detective story trying to piece it all together. And the picture that emerges from history is that of a peasant preacher wandering from village to village in the first century, forecasting the end of the world. Jesus and his disciples were gathering followers as they traveled south from Galilee, heading for Jerusalem and what Jesus knew would be the final showdown. Holy Week would begin with his glorious entry into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, but on the Friday or Saturday before, they came here, to Jericho. It's an oasis town with a tropical climate. Back then, it was popular with Roman high rollers, a glamorous place. He would have known all about the glitz and the architectural splendor of this place, but his interest was in the poor. All along the way, Jesus had been telling his disciples that he was going to die in Jerusalem, but they seemed to have paid no attention. Jesus, however, knew that the time he had left to get his message across was running out. I love sketching on the spot. You have to look closely and draw fast. The sketchbook making notes, looking at the costumes, capturing the faces, really absorbing this environment. My dad would have absolutely loved this place um, because although it's chaotically, boisterously modern, uh, in the faces, in the costumes, in the clothing, in the atmosphere, 
in the language that he would have overheard, in the smells and the perfumes coming off the stalls, he would have been able to transport himself back into ancient times. Because there is, there is a kind of line through all these places in the eyes of the people that you meet that I know it sounds romantic, but they do transport you. News of Jesus and his preaching had made him something of a controversial celebrity. And as our Easter story begins, he and his entourage were making their way through the dusty outskirts of Jericho, when suddenly a blind beggar called out to him. Have mercy on me, he said. Let me recover my sight. And Jesus picks him out, the scruffiest and most unfortunate member of the crowd, and he heals him. Now, of course, it's a miracle, but it also has another meaning. Jesus had given him faith. He'd allowed him to see the word and the message of God. This painting is of Christ healing the blind man, and it's by El Greco, who was one of my dad's favorite artists. But even my father would have to agree that it takes a stretch of the imagination to, to see the events El Greco has described as belonging to this place, Jericho. I mean, for a start, he's missed out the falafel stalls and the noisy yellow cabs. I mean, he's made this place look as grand as ancient Rome. On my old bedroom wall, this made Jericho look European. I knew it probably wasn't accurate. The place is a bit faded now, but it's seen the bad times and the good. Jericho's about 11,000 years old. The oldest city in the world. Absolute cacophony chaos. Modern, noisy, sirens. Hello. Drawing people always attracts a crowd, but the subject is all I see. I grew up with religious pictures featuring people who looked European, but you find the truth in the faces of men like this. My dad would have loved drawing here. He'd probably have tried out his pidgin Arabic. What do you think? Good. Thank you very much. Oh, he's, it doesn't look too happy. <laughs> it's all right. <laughs> Try harder, <laughs> Lachlan. Jesus mixed with the poor and the needy. Some powerful people found this threatening and he made enemies. In six days' time, on Good Friday, they'd have their revenge, here, in Jerusalem. This city was the setting for the key events of the last week of Jesus' life, what's called the Passion of Christ, the Easter story that ends with the crucifixion and the resurrection. There's been a settlement here forever, but for me, it all starts with the Bible stories. I mean, you're really staring into the eyes of history here. Since the days of King Solomon, since the days of Herod the Great and Jesus of Nazareth, there has been a Jerusalem. Here on the Mount of Olives, you begin to realize that for billions of people, over thousands of years, this has represented the center of their world, the center of their faith. So to actually be here and to realize that this is a place of beauty, of gilded light, of a variety of noises from the church bells to the Muslim calls to prayer to the bird song of the Holy Land, well, it's quite overwhelming. And every Easter, at church perhaps in Glasgow, when I tried to imagine the backdrop to the Easter story, well, I always reverted to painted images I had seen before. Mm -hmm. 
According to the Gospels, Jesus stood here on the morning of Palm Sunday. Crowds of his supporters were waiting to welcome him into the city, their Messiah. Jesus entered Jerusalem through an ancient gate, buried long ago beneath this one. He was surrounded by cheering crowds, but he now had five days left to live. And he knew it. Now this painting is by the 14th century Italian artist called Giotto. You've got Jerusalem looking like a kind of fantastical place with towers and turrets, beautiful, elegant arcades. And in fact, it actually resembles 14th century Florence where Giotto lived much more than first century Jerusalem. As an artist, Giotto was renowned for being able to paint figures that seemed to be believable, that seemed to be human. And I certainly can believe in this Jesus, as he arrives in Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, he's celebrated and welcomed as the Messiah. People are even trying to climb the trees in order to get a better view. And look, the donkey's got a smile on too. The church was really keen to encourage this kind of imagery because what it did was it allowed people who were thousands of miles away from Jerusalem, even those who couldn't read, to come to a much better understanding of a narrative that the church wanted everyone to become familiar with. Once he'd ridden into the city, Jesus' fate was sealed. Every step took him nearer Golgotha, the site of the cross, five days away. Jerusalem was then a Jewish city ruled by Romans. In time, it would be briefly Christian, but it's been Islamic and Jewish ever since. Today, at the Damascus Gate Market in the Arab quarter of Jerusalem, you see Muslims, Jews and Christians all shopping for tasty vegetables. The old master painters were Christians. The Jerusalem they imagined rang with the sound of church bells. But being here, the reality sounds very different. The old city echoes with the Adan, the Muslim call to prayer coming from mosques all around. How you see Jerusalem, how you understand the Easter story depends on your point of view. I've been brought up with an entirely Christian understanding of history and one of the things that brushes under the carpet, I think, is that Jesus was Jewish. He was a temple-worshipping, kosher-keeping, circumcised Jew. We're on the southern side of what was once the Jewish Temple Mount, a huge religious complex dominating the city. So this place would have been extremely familiar and extremely holy to him. And what we see around us is a surviving piece of first century Jerusalem because Jesus would have climbed these steps on his way up to the entrance of the temple. On the Monday of Holy Week, Jesus and the disciples came here. Today, thousands more come to be close to the stones that were the stage for the Easter drama. As an artist, you sometimes have to make sense of complicated subjects. I often have to imagine things that have disappeared. The same skill that archaeologist Joe Uriel needs for his job. Well, we are located to the south of the Temple Mount. This is where the Jewish temple stood exactly during the time of Jesus. Over the past 2,000 years, this is the heart of Jerusalem, the religious focal point of the city. The temple was one of the largest temples in the Roman Empire. Uh, we're talking about one of the most magnificent structures in the Roman Empire. It would have been a place to come, just as you would go visit today, the Taj Mahal, so too the Temple Mount. When it's hard to separate myth and miracle from fact, the real can take you by surprise. 
So we're actually in a place where we can walk in, in the footsteps of Jesus. That's wonderful because Jesus still remains in my head this kind of imaginary figure. But to have um, something physical that we can connect to him, wonderful. So 2,000 year old blocks of stone from the Jewish temple of Herod the Great. Looking at these blocks, we have some physical certainty. This is a passport into King Herod's magnificent temple. That's right. We must assume then that if Jesus walked through these places, who knows, his hands might have brushed against the stone. Possibly. Possibly. Well, I've got to have to touch it now, won't I? Fantastic. I mean, I still find it in my imagination quite hard to believe that this subtle little groove which has been carved into the block is 2,000 years old. There was a mason, there was a guy with a little chisel making this impression and by touching it, hello, I've got another artist touching back here. I can feel his handprint. To be in the shadow of a building that has stood for 20 centuries puts your own human existence into perspective. We've got a short span here, 70 years, and every so often you need a touchstone to make you realise not only how small you are, but how magnificent this world we live in is. Uh, and I really do get that feeling here. Only the base of what was the Jewish temple complex remains. These walls now support an Islamic site, and the surviving Western wall is as close as Jews can get to their spiritual home. To approach it, I must cover my head. And when I go to places of sacred worship within the Christian culture, I'm used to finding a cathedral, I'm used to finding a place that is ornate, decorated, full of silver and frescoes. This, this is raw. It's as real as any holy building, but it no longer exists. The Romans destroyed the Jewish temple in the year 70. I've never been in a sacred place like this. It's, it's chaotic, noisy, the songs of people celebrating and the songs of people praying with a kind of intensity that seems, when you listen to them up against the wall, actually quite sad. And that's because for centuries, the great story of Jewish culture has been a narrative of loss and longing. To Jews visiting in the first century, the temple that stood here was the awe-inspiring house of God, visible for miles around. It's the Monday of Holy Week. Jesus has just four more days to live. The drama intensifies when he and the disciples enter the temple and find it full of birds, beasts, and money men. According to the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Jesus goes into the temple and he kicks off. It's really not what the Prince of Peace is supposed to do, but he is furious. As a boy, I spent hours enjoying the detail in this 16th century picture by an unnamed Dutch artist. Now this is a painting of Christ driving the moneylenders out of the temple. Artists have always loved depicting this subject because it reveals Jesus in a human light as someone who can lose his rag. Although this scene isn't really very accurate. It's a figment of the artist's imagination, the architecture, the costumes that people are wearing. They belong to the Dutch 16th century, not the first century in Judea. But what does ring true is that the cast of Gurning characters really do reveal the kinds of things that were cheesing Jesus off about what was going on in the temple. I mean, just look at them. They're grotesque. They're spreading their filth and dishevelment across the sacred place. You've got a quack doctor here. You've got people who appear to be gambling. There's a pig that's running through the courtyard. I mean, they really are charlatans, hucksters, and they have turned this sacred place into a den of thieves. 
and right there in the middle of the painting, you've got Jesus, and he's got a whip, and he's getting medieval on the asses of the moneylenders. This is an extraordinary bust up in a biblical soap opera. In the first century, the huge temple made Jerusalem famous throughout the Roman Empire as a religious center. But of course, it was also a city of business. I say they freeze, get on your knees, but pray for warmth and green paper. I say they drought your I guess I never really thought of Jerusalem as a real place, you know, somewhere that people take the bins out at night and go out and buy toilet roll. I've only ever experienced this city through paintings and in my imagination it's just been a kind of sacred vision. And sitting here in the souk, I do feel I'm inside a painting. The light above me is gold and there's a blue sky with doves flying across it. I can hear Hebrew, I can hear Arabic. I can see the colourful wares and the sparkles of things in shops for sale. But real life happens in these streets. You know, this is a place of traders and merchants and the hard sell. And Jesus never shied away from the seedier side of life, but he just wouldn't tolerate it in the front room of his dad's house. Old Jerusalem is full of visual contrasts. Under these high stone walls, shadows are a deep blue. But just around the corner, it's a rainbow of colours and sunshine. In the old city, every street's a shopping centre. People aren't used to someone stopping with a sketchbook. It usually takes about five minutes, but Mustafa was on me in moments. Is your shop in the picture? Let me see. Oh, I've just missed it out. Oh, I'll show you my grandfather picture. Your grandfather painted? Ah, wonderful. What, what kind of things? He's a professional. Yeah. He's an artist. He was an artist. And did he paint landscapes or...? Everything. Everything. But you hope you like the drawing. Yeah, the gorgeous pictures. And I'm feeling on it because uh, each color, you make me feeling you have a story. Ah, what, what kind of story? Muslims, Christians and Jews. Well, I'm delighted to hear that you see that in my, in my painting. I, how are you how, how are looking on? Because what I've, I see, you have a beautiful, great stuff. <laughs> Very good. Thank you. I'm for you. All right, thank you. Thank you. The countdown to Jesus' execution had begun. And behind the scenes, the authorities were watching and worrying, trying to figure out how they could get their hands on this troublesome preacher man from Nazareth. Jesus was aware that his earthly days were now numbered, and he was dropping heavy hints at a dinner party at the home of someone called Simon the Leper. According to some accounts, it was on the Wednesday of Holy Week. Jesus had just 48 hours left, but still the disciples hadn't fully cottoned on. This meal is a turning point. Over the food, a row breaks out that leads directly to Jesus' capture and crucifixion. It all begins with a bottle of perfume. If you follow your nose through the souk, you can still find the scent Hello. that Hello. Jesus smelled that night. Can you tell me yes. a little more about this? What is this? This is, uh, this is the nard oil, the original one. It's made from original flower spike nard. It's called a flower called spike nard. Uh, yes, this is very expensive flower. Where do you find that? This is find it in the Alp, in the Alp and the Himalaya. Yes. So it's very rare. It's very rare one. Well, where, where did they? So it was brought from all those exotic places here to the Holy Land. To the Holy Land, yes. And what was it used for at the time? This is to the anoint the, the, the body of the dead people. And they did, in uh, Jewish time, they put an anointing. Okay. They fill uh, the perfume with the... With the whole body or just a part of the body? Uh, no, the whole body. The whole body. The body so they, yes. they, 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 they wash yeah. the whole body in this? Yes. That must be an expensive process. Yes. For one bottle, it costs about 300 dinars. Okay. More, more, than, more than people might earn in, we, a, in, yes. a, in a year. Yes. Yes. Very expensive one. So how yes. much does this cost today? This is it's around. When you come to our shop, we'll give you good prices. Give you good, absolutely, <laughs> yes, I <laughs> hope so. Turns out the nard oil is now just a few pounds. Back then, one denarius was a day's wages. Jesus' oil cost 300. 
The use of this fragrance gives the name to this Easter landmark moment, the anointing. It's another occasion when Jesus surprises his friends by mixing with a kind of social outcast. Present at the dinner is a woman called Mary. There are so many Marys, but according to the Gospel of Luke, a sinner. She might even have been a prostitute. And during the dinner, she begins to anoint Jesus' head and his feet, and then she wipes it off using her hair. Now, the disciples who are also present at the dinner get themselves all worked up, particularly Judas, who looks after the money box. They turn around and they say, what is she doing? This is an expensive perfume. We could have sold it and then given the money to the poor. At which point, Jesus says, stop. She has done me a good deed. You will always have the poor, but you won't always have me. She has done this for my burial. It's the fatal moment. Judas storms off to the Jewish authorities. For a bribe, he tells them where they'll find Jesus the next night, in Jerusalem for a Passover dinner. The Saviour is doomed. We've entered the last 24 hours of Jesus' life and these moments will inspire more works of art than any other day in human history. At Passover, Jews celebrate their ancestors' escape from enslavement in Egypt with a special meal. The Ein Moor family of Jerusalem have kindly invited me into their home to witness another ritual meal the Friday night Shabbat dinner. In Jewish culture, meals like this link all generations to their history. Ingredients are symbolic. Preparation and procedure are everything. The disciples didn't know the Passover meal would be their last supper with Jesus. They met to eat and give thanks, but they were left divided and in dismay. It wasn't just Jesus' last supper. These were his final hours as a free man. The closing moments of fellowship with his disciples, a quiet pause in the drama of Easter. It took place in what the Gospels call the upper room. And here, it isn't. This room is called the Cenacle, and by tradition, it's where the most famous meal in history took place, the Last Supper. But nothing that you can see here actually dates from the first century. And there are never many tourists here because I think some people are slightly cynical about the cynical. They don't believe necessarily that those events could have taken place in this room because what we see is really a stage set that was built in the 13th to 14th century. And although it's not entirely authentic, What's extraordinary is it resembles exactly the space imagined by those artists in faraway Europe when they pictured the events of the Last Supper. In my children's Bible, it's all very Hollywood, or maybe Hollywood. We've got Jesus here with his blue eyes and blonde hair, our fantastic leading man, all dressed in personal white. Someone that looks a bit like Kirk Douglas and a sneaky-looking Judas. This is a cinematic Last Supper, but there's one other source for this image, I think, and that's a painting by one of the greatest artists of the Renaissance. Leonardo da Vinci's version of The Last Supper was painted on the wall of a dining room in an Italian monastery. And it was designed in such a way that the monks munching on their pasta could dine in good company. And the first thing that you notice about da Vinci's painting is that he has a very unconventional seating plan. Everybody is placed on one side of the table. So it's almost as if this meal is being performed for our benefit in a space whose exaggerated perspective seems to draw us into the very heart of the action and the figure of Jesus himself. There seems to be lots of consternation and hand-waving going on, and very pointedly, the face 
of Judas Iscariot is cast into shadow. That night, Jesus kept turning what should have been a celebratory feast into a gloomy premonition of betrayal and suffering. And when the food finally arrived, he told the famished apostles that the bread and the wine were to be seen as symbols of his own body and blood, a sign of the bond between himself, his followers, and God. The Last Supper was a Jewish ritual that became a Christian one, Holy Communion, a little bit of the Easter story that happens all year round. Every week in Christian churches across the world, this ceremony is repeated. Bread and wine are shared, symbolizing the body and the blood of Christ. The Gospels tell how at the Last Supper, Jesus dropped heavy hints. He knew that amongst his brothers, there was a traitor. Truly, truly, one of you shall betray me. And suddenly, the room went silent. Jesus handed a piece of bread to Judas. The message was clear. What you must do, do quickly, he said, and Judas left the room. After dinner, the remaining disciples trooped out into the dusk, probably a bit dazed. Jesus led them to an olive grove. According to tradition, this is the Garden of Gethsemane. Well, the olive trees seem ancient enough, but this is the place where the saviour of humankind is supposed to have been betrayed. This might be the site of the Garden of Gethsemane, but to me, it just doesn't feel like it. Being an artist is about pencils and paint and paper, but it's also about feeling the inspiration. At dusk, this olive grove just outside Jerusalem feels to me like a more convincing Gethsemane. Jesus wanted a quiet place to pray, and although he was accompanied by a few of his disciples, he must have been at this moment the loneliest man in the world. He knew exactly what was coming, and he prayed to God to be released from the ordeal. But there was no way out and so an angel was sent to give him strength. For me, this is one of the most poignant moments in the New Testament. It's the, the anxious calm before the storm. And it's immortalized in two great paintings by a pair of 15th century Italian artists who just happened to be brothers-in-law, Andrea Mantegna and Giovanni Bellini. Now their two versions of the agony in the garden appear to be quite similar. And I love the idea that both of these characters might have been looking over one another's shoulders, trying to outdo each other. Now, whereas Andrea depicts a Jerusalem in the background of his painting that looks like a fantasy castle out of the Wizard of Oz, Giovanni gives us a small hilltop town. He doesn't want to exaggerate things too much. But where they both agree is that their Garden of Gethsemane is a boulder-strewn place, perhaps symbolising the bleak story that is about to unfold. And there, in the middle distance, you can see a little cavalcade of figures, a colourful bunch of soldiers, their armour clinking as they approach to arrest Jesus. I mean, the paintings are so serene, they're so beautiful, that I find myself wanting to shout out to Jesus in this, in this moment of calm, please, please just run, you don't have to do this for us. <laughs> 
Now, the Son of God gets tangled up in a legal system that's complicated because his country is run by both Roman and Jewish officials. 21 centuries later, the same land is again home to two different peoples. Every day on the occupied West Bank, workers queue before dawn to leave the territory. Here at Bethlehem, the Palestinian Authority has a form of control. Once through Israel's wall, these men travel to jobs in Jerusalem under Israeli administration. From the arrest in the garden onwards, the Gospels of Matthew, Mark and Luke are very detailed. The Easter story becomes almost a minute-by-minute -minute drama. Thousands are flocking into Jerusalem for the Passover holiday, but the Roman and the Jewish authorities are interested in just one visitor, the preacher from Nazareth. The Jesus problem must be solved as quickly and as quietly as possible. It's the Thursday evening of Holy Week. The first chapter of the Easter story will end soon, and for Jesus, badly. The Jewish authorities, the Sanhedrin, hate this upstart preacher from Nazareth, but they're worried. Jerusalem is like a tinderbox, and the guy they've got banged up in jail is the fuse. Some people believe he's the Messiah, but whichever way this pans out, they don't want to be seen executing one of their own. They want the Romans to do the dirty work. Jesus is in jail. The disciples are in hiding, in shock, probably. They finally got the message that his prophecies are coming true. But surely, they think to themselves, we've seen Jesus perform miracles. He's going to escape, is he? In the dead of night, Jesus is brought before a hastily set up court. They're desperate to charge him with blasphemy. But Jesus simply won't take the bait. Tell us whether you are the Christ, the Son of God, they demand to know. But all Jesus says is, well, if you say so. It infuriates them, so they slap him. But everybody knows that Jesus is guilty. And in the morning, he's brought to the offices of the Roman administrator, Pontius Pilate. It's Good Friday. I always got the impression that Pontius Pilate wasn't such a bad guy. I mean, at school, I learned about someone who didn't really want to execute Jesus in the first place. And in my children's illustrated Bible, he declares, I find in him no fault at all. Pontius Pilate wasn't interested in the blasphemy charges, but his Jewish colleagues kept telling him that Jesus was trying to lead a tax revolt. And that was a much more serious matter. But still, Pilate starts to wriggle. This painting by Hieronymus Bosch shows the moment Pilate tried to avoid taking responsibility for killing Jesus. At Passover, it was traditional for the Roman governor to release a prisoner. And Hieronymus Bosch paints the scene as if it's a kind of pantomime. We've got this figure here, who I think is Pilate wearing a very fancy hat, presenting Jesus to the crowd. Behold the man, he declares, and he offers to release the king of the Jews. The crowd, however, have been prepped by their priests to demand the release of someone else, a robber called Barabbas. They chant his name and eventually they shriek, let the blood be on our hands and on our children. Now we're on the final pages of the Easter story. Jesus has less than 24 hours left on earth as he begins to walk to the place of execution. Don't run out of paper. Move faster. Church towers and the minarets. Every Friday, Christians gather to follow the route Jesus travelled carrying his cross. It's called the Via Dolorosa, which means way of grief. Pilgrims have been doing this for centuries on the same stones 
where they believe Jesus walked towards death. This is extrasensory, non-stop. The procession stops at places where Jesus paused, where he was helped, where he stumbled. These are the famous stations of the cross. Fourth station, here Jesus meets his mother. Such an immersive experience because you're moving from tight little alleys out to open spaces, through passageways under minarets, beside the souk in the bazaar, and people are singing and chanting. The crowd passes straight through the middle of Arab Jerusalem, but the market stall holders don't seem to take any notice. It does give you some sense of the physical, sensory chaos and bustle that must have accompanied Jesus on that last day. The Via Dolorosa ends in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, said to stand where the crucifixion and the resurrection happened. For Christians, the holiest of holy ground. In here, it's Easter every day. I definitely felt the energy of history and belief. Well, that was, uh, that was guerrilla sketching. Through the streets, through the pathways, through the soup, to combine speedy sketching with an environment of passion and devotion like I've just experienced. It's, it's not anything I've ever done before. But I'll treasure this sketchbook. Being here in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre at this moment kind of redefines awesome. Good Friday, never felt like this. In our cold Protestant church in Scotland, we sang hymns. We had a few scriptures read out loud, but to really, really feel the core of what this moment in the scriptures is about. Wow, well, I tell you to come here. <laughs> because then, then you'll really get a taste of why people of great faith feel so strongly, so poignantly, and eventually so joyfully about the Easter story. And all along that way, all along through the procession, there was talk of suffering. There was talk of this figure, Jesus, being burdened with the cross, with his spirit being crushed, with the pain he was enduring, with the insults that were being flung at him. And I tell you, in those passageways, bumped from side to side with all the people in the, in the darkness emerging into the light, in the shadows, in the heat, wow, <laughs> you felt a little, a little of what that atmosphere of Good Friday must have been like. Outside, blinking in the glare, travelers from all over Christendom take a breather. For them, this is a pilgrimage, a once-in-a-lifetime experience. The scene is drenched in sunlight. It's perfect for watercolour. You've got to move fast, though. The shadows are lengthening. The colours will be fleeting. One moment bright, then gone forever. The blue sky of Jerusalem. You've got to get this right straight away onto the white paper, no mistakes. I love this job. Painting pictures takes me to the most fantastic places. And it's not really like hard work. You see amazing sights, you sit next to extraordinary folk. And every day is a little lesson in life, I tell you, when you've got a paintbrush in your hand. Inside the church, I was caught up in the exhilaration and the strong emotions this place inspires. 
Whether something actually happened here or over there isn't really the point. It's not about facts. It's about faith. The place of the skull, Golgotha, sounds about right, doesn't it? Somewhere that a master of the universe would be executed. But in actual fact, it was probably just a small pile of rubble outside the city walls, a wasteland. Today, the extraordinary Church of the Holy Sepulchre stands where legend has it the crucifixion took place. There have been many incarnations of this building, but there's always been something standing here where the Easter story comes to its climax. This is a kind of pilgrimage for me, standing where my father never did. Most of the great artists who depicted scenes from the Bible story journeyed here only in their imaginations. They believed, even though they hadn't seen all this. Rembrandt was one of the most prolific illustrators of the Bible stories, and one of his favorite subjects was the crucifixion. And here, in this etching, he gives us the full works. There are crowds, there are men in armor, there are costumes and horses. And depicted as it is in brutal black and white, it really gives you the sense that this shaft of light descending from the sky represents God's love for his son, but also in the shadows, his fury at the rest of humanity. I mean, it's a, it's a cinematic image, and it really does remind me of all those Hollywood epic movies I used to watch at Easter time when I was little. And to see this image, that I actually copied when I was a child. Here, against the backdrop where this event happened, supposedly in that building. Wow, that makes this experience all the more powerful for me. The church is built around a rocky outcrop, a stony fist in a glove of gold and marble, low lit by candles, night, and day. This rock is Golgotha. This is the place where the cross was erected, with one on either side for the two thieves who were executed alongside Jesus. Now the death was an appalling one, and Jesus was moved to cry out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And in spite of all this horror. This moment in the Christian story is actually about a victory. It's about Jesus' victory over his persecutors, his oppressors, but most importantly, his victory over death, because this is the moment that will lead to his resurrection and to his greatest glory. <laughs> Even as a child, I couldn't quite believe in the earliest pictures of the crucifixion. They always made Jesus look triumphant and strong. This later painting by Dutchman Dirk Boots felt like it was speaking directly to me. And we are no longer in a place where the image is emphasizing Jesus' divine, superhuman power. What we see here is a picture of suffering. This painting declares he was fragile, he was vulnerable, he wept tears, just as you would if you had to go through this ordeal yourself. The greatest pictures are worth a thousand biblical words. They go straight to the heart. The week that shook the world ended down there at Golgotha. It began with Jesus here on the Mount of Olives, staring down at Jerusalem. Looking out across the city helps me put what I have experienced in those streets into perspective. Now I've actually explored this city. I think I, I know its colors and I know its shape, so I can identify places on this horizon I've actually been to. This is not a stranger anymore. I've been through all those little streets, been through the soup, been in the churches, been in 
the grottos and at the western wall and now I think I need the bigger picture. I think I'm ready to try and paint its portrait, really. One of the things about painting is you've got to be very sensitive to the light that surrounds you. That might just sound obvious, but light in different places, in different countries, has different colours. And I'm used to northern Scottish, British light, which is a bit cool and cold, whereas here there is a golden warmth to the sun. And I'm not making this up. There's also a crimson pink quality to it. I've never seen anything like it. I think it's amazing how the art of the Holy Land really does have the ability to provoke great empathy and emotion, even in people who don't have enormous faith. I thought I knew all about the Easter story from paintings and from my illustrated Bible. But the Holy Land has changed the way I think about Jesus' death. Now it's more than a story in a picture book. It's about a real person in a real landscape. Well, I wouldn't use this as a route map to get around Jerusalem. The details are a bit all over the place, but I think I've managed to capture just a little bit of the higgledy-piggledy wonder of this ancient place. I feel so much closer to this subject than I did on the first day of my journey. Back in Glasgow, the pages of my sketchbook remind me of what I saw, heard and felt as I followed Jesus' journey to the cross. My father's not here to look through my sketchbooks with me, but he's the person who inspired me to undertake this voyage. Digging out some of his crucifixion studies, I can now see them and him in a new light. These are just a few of the works of art that he created, inspired by that subject. But my father had to imagine Golgotha and all those places associated with the Easter story. And for me, one of the most poignant parts of this whole pilgrimage has been being able to go and make work in places I know he would have found so thrilling. And now I have to say I am even more impressed because well, my dad wasn't a very religious man, but in these images, I find that he manages to convey the passion and the emotional intensity that I have now actually experienced following my journey into the Holy Land. Next time, the journey that ends with Jesus' death on the cross continues with his miraculous resurrection. I'll follow this next chapter in the Easter story as painted by great artists and ask my question about his mother. Why do we see more of Mary in art than in the Bible? Your own personal Jesus Someone to hear your prayers Someone who cares Your own personal Jesus Someone to hear your prayers, someone who's there.